every promise in the book is mine every chapter every verse and every line all good morning and welcome to our pine grove sunday morning worship service i would like to ask everyone to please pray for the Aubrey family and the Floyd family and the many great injustice in this country and pray for our country. I do not have any new information about the reopening of our sanctuary at this time. So please continue to do your Bible study and your devotion. Thank you and enjoy the service. Say to you uh, this morning, uh, good morning and uh, just a special shout out uh, to the Stevens family. On Monday morning, a good friend of mine, Jesse Stevens, came to work and told me uh, his sister, had Maddie, had been burned out. And so we fought that hard all week long. And then on Thursday afternoon, we left uh, work and uh, got a report sometimes uh, this morning, Friday, uh, that he had a heart attack. So we want you to be uh, in prayer uh, for the Stevens family and, and all the um, uh, just the difficulties that they're dealing with at this time. Uh, one of the things that I think I heard somebody say is that when you're in Christ, nothing that happens on this side will affect our eternity. And one man sort of said it like this, is that the worst the suffering on this side, perhaps, is the greater the blessing is on the other side. And so eternity is what we look forward to as well. So this morning, I have a very familiar passage of scripture that I want to talk to you about. Perhaps it's something on, uh, the, uh, on your mind, and, and, and maybe uh, somehow we can make some sense uh, out of this. I want to talk about when you fail, or even when you fail to say it like that. And I noticed in the topic of uh, the subject, I'm not saying if you fail, I'm saying when you fail, because there's no doubt in, uh, in my mind that you will fail. But the great news is that when, if and when you fail, Jesus is always there. There's a familiar passage of scripture, I believe in Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 34, that I'll read, and then we'll see if we can make some sense out of that. But in verse 31, it reads, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded, that is, he desires, or he is asking excessively to have you, and that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned, that is, when you have confessed and you have repented, when you have turned again, strengthen the brothers. And Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. Let's pray. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, just the Holy Spirit that you've given to be our confidant, be our guide, to be able to teach us, to be able to help us deal with the madness that we endure in life, to help us uh, know that there is someone who's just standing by, waiting to restore us and give us ministry to be able to do it. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Have you ever failed in some way? Have you ever caused trouble for or headaches to your family or your friends? You've done something that it just, you know, affected everybody around you. Have you ever done anything in your life that has had a lasting impact on your life? Perhaps your life or perhaps the life of, of other people as well in your life. But here's something that I find that's so, just so crazy and unique is that when we fail, People who are closest to us, they're ready to judge us and, and to be able to throw us away. And, and this is so crazy. And, and, and what else is so crazy is that 
people will judge you even when your opinion or the conclusion that you draw is just different from the one that they draw as well. And, 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 and here's something that you need to know, is when you don't agree with someone, you can't get angry because it's their opinion that way. You can't get, you can't get, you can't judge them because they don't think like you think or see things like you do as well. But here's something, the Bible never tells us that we are to judge somebody and throw them away at all. In Galatians chapter six, Paul writes this verse, and he says this, for if anyone, that is a man, woman, boy, or girl, is overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual. And what is so key when you hear that verse, you which are spiritual, it means simply this, use your spiritual sense, not your common sense. So often in life you hear people saying, well, God gives us common sense. But I'm not so sure God wants you to use your common sense as much as he wants you to use your spiritual sense. But you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted as well. You see, why, why do we use our spiritual sense? It's because of this. Common sense don't tell me to give my money away. Common sense would not tell me to tithe 10% of my income. It's my spiritual sense that gives me that uh, idea, that concept in my life. Common sense does not tell me to forgive you. Common sense tells me to pay you back as well, but it's my spiritual sense that tells me that I ought to forgive you. Yeah. Common sense does not tell me to turn the other cheek. It's my spiritual sense that tells me to use the other cheek as well, or to let you have that opportunity, let you get away with a circumstance of a situation that you deal with in your life. You see, common sense tells you to judge a person, to throw them away when they messed up some things in your yes. life. But it's your spiritual sense that you learn to deal with a person in life and give them a second chance, perhaps. Perhaps somebody is listening to me today and, 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 and you've fallen into sin or, or, or you feel like you're, you're all alone. Well, this is typically what I want to say to you today is this. You may be embarrassed, you may be ashamed, and you may even be afraid about what has happened or where you are in life. And you may feel like there is no hope, there's no answer to the problem that you're dealing with. But I got good news for you. When nobody cares, Jesus does. You need to remember yes. that. Yes. You, when, 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 listen, when others will not forgive you, Jesus will forgive you. Yes. When, when, when you feel like you're unlovable, Jesus still loves you as well. When you feel like you're all alone, you need to always remember that God said he'd never leave you or forsake you as well. And if you have sinned, then there's some problem, some issue that you're dealing with in your life. Jesus Christ will not throw you away. He still loves you. And so as we look at this passage of scripture, what I want you to see is Three things, what Satan desires, what Jesus our Savior desires, and what Peter desired as well. So looking at the first thing, we find this, what Satan desires. And what we find out about Satan is this, Satan could, we could call him this, he's our scheming adversary. He's always plotting, he's always got a plan trying to knock us off our, our, our rock or our rail that we're dealing with in the life. Look at verse 31 again, if you will. It says, for Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. In other words, Jesus Christ is giving Peter a warning that Satan is excessively asking to have him. He is excessively asking. And this is the idea. It's as if Satan constantly uh, bombards God. He bombards Jesus Christ. With, let me have him. Let me have him. Let me, let me try him. Let me test him as well in our life as well. But you know, this is not primary to the passage of scripture that we're dealing with. It happened to Joshua, the high priest in the book of Zechariah. For we find out that he was standing uh, before the angel of the Lord and Satan was standing right on his right hand and accusing him, but it was the angel of the Lord who vindicated him as well. 
He stood against Job as well. So there it is. He tried. He tried Peter. He tried Joshua. He tried Job. And he'll try you as well. He will stand against you. You need to understand that because he is our scheming adversary that we deal with. Even Satan, what he's trying to do, he's trying to affect your testimony. He's trying to affect your life. He's trying to take away your hope. And it ought not be like that, I agree, but we must, we must understand is that temptation will occur. Temptation comes, spiritual attacks are real, and we live with them as well. Life would be great if we did not have any of these attacks, but it just does not exist that way. Why is it that Satan desire you? Why would, he, why would he want to interfere with your life? Why would he want to mess with you? It, it is because of this. In verse 31, he says it's sort of like this, where he says that he may sift you as wheat. Now that is an agricultural term, and it, used, it, 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 it refers to the process of separating the husk from the wheat grain itself. And what would happen is that a, a person would crush the, the grain, the husk, under his foot, and they would throw it up into the air, and the husk would be blown away by the wind, and the good grain would be left behind. So what Satan was actually trying to do is he was trying to prove that Peter's faith was not genuine at this time, and he believed that he could separate Peter from his faith. He'd already been successful with Judah. So why not try to rest as well? And consider the actions of the disciples once Jesus Christ had been, after this conversation, after Jesus Christ had been crucified. All of the disciples left except John for a little while as well. You see, just like Satan desires the disciples, he desires to sift you as wheat as well. He wants to separate you from your faith. And so later on, as Peter grows and in, in, his, in, in, in his walk with Christ, he writes the book of 1 Peter. And in verse number 8 of chapter number 5, he says this, Now to us, he would say, be sober-minded, be watchful, because your scheming adversary, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he might desire, devour. But Satan wants to, you to become discouraged. He wants you to give up in life. He wants you to lose your love, your joy, your peace that you have in your life. He wants to destroy your confidence. The victory that you have over sin, he wants to mess with that victory that you're dealing with. And listen, once you've lost your joy, once you've lost your peace, you then become a negative impact on believers. You become a negative impact on the loss as well, and that's exactly what Satan wants out of you. That's why he desires all of us as well. Let me say this. If you're lost, Satan wants, to, wants, wants you to believe that you don't need Jesus Christ in your life. He wants you to think that there are no consequences for living any way that you want to live in life and that sin is no big deal. Just have fun, live it up in life. That's if you're lost. That's what he wants you to believe. But what if you're saved? What if you are a believer as well? He wants to make you believe that after you've given your life to Christ and established yourself as a believer, he wants you to understand that the Christian, he wants you to believe that the Christian life is just not worth living. He wants you to believe that you can't live the Christian life. He wants you to believe that it's just too hard in order to live it. And I have to agree that it is a hard life to live, but with Jesus Christ on your side, you can't live that life. He wants to believe that all this church going and prayer time and Bible study all is just a waste of your time as well. That's what he wants to convince you of. He wants to believe, make you, and, and convince you that you're missing out on the good stuff. All the club life and all the things that you did in the past that you really don't do anymore. He wants to make you believe that you're missing out on all the good stuff. But that's just not true. He wants you to believe that it's just no way that you can have a successful walk with you. Jesus Christ, but you can. So what we have looked at so far is that Satan desires destruction. He is a scheming adversary. So now let's look at what Jesus desires. First of all, Jesus desires determination, and he is our strong anchor in life. Verse 32 says it like this, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. 
And when you have turned, when you have confessed, when you have repented again, strengthen your brothers. Notice that phrase, is that, that, that your faith fail you not, is what Jesus had prayed for. And, 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 and we know this, that Peter had messed up in a lot of ways, huge ways. He had failed as well. But Jesus wanted him to be, to live by determination and endurance in his life. So often in life, we, we, we use this mindset of, of saying that I know I'm not perfect or I can't be perfect, so, so why, why try? Why fight against it as well? But that's just not true because the Bible gives us very, lots of examples and verses to be able to tell us that we can resist the devil. It's in James 4 and 7, for he tells us this, for if you would submit that for yourself to God, Resist the devil, he will flee away from you. So we can live a spiritual life. We can live the good life. It, it's hard. I agree that it's hard. And, and we have verses that tell us that we can do it as well. But there's no better verse than in verse number 32 that we have in our text. Because it says, and these are the words of Christ, but I prayed for you. How awesome is it that Peter hadn't done anything yet. He hadn't failed at this very moment. And Jesus Christ is saying to Peter, I prayed for you. And that's easy, past tense. Yesterday I prayed for you. Before you were born, Peter, I prayed for you. Before you even fail, I prayed for you. It's what Jesus was telling you. I don't know about you, but as a, as a pastor and, 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 and even ministry uh, in prisons and all, and you know, from time to time you'll hear somebody say, I prayed for you. And I'm thinking, that is just so good. But it's, in my opinion, the best thing to hear them say is, I prayed for you. I prayed for you past them. I've already prayed for you as well. I, I, I think that's just great to know that Somebody cared so much for me that when I was not even in that presence, they were thinking about me and loved me enough to pray for me even before a difficulty had arrived. But Jesus Christ is saying, I pray for you. That's even better than neighbors and friends and church members praying for you because Christ is praying for us all. First Timothy 2nd chapter, verse number 5. It says this, for there is one God, there is one mediator between God and men, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. Yes. That is Jesus Christ is our mediator. And so when you face temptation, you got to remember this, that Jesus Christ is our strong anchor, and he's there. And listen, Jesus Christ knew that Peter would soon fail. And even knowing this, he gave him instructions of how to be restored. And that's what's so good about this. And he says that in, in a portion of that verse 32, for he says this, and when thou art converted, that is, strengthen, strengthen the brethren. In other words, he gave him a ministry even before. And this, this is what we must always understand is that out of the mess that we make, Jesus creates ministry in our life. Listen, we're all going to fail. We're all going to fall from time to time in this life. And if it wasn't true, I would not tell you so. But we have got to quit using and using that as an excuse to justify the sin in our life. We must be determined to strive toward perfection. Stop making excuses for the errors, the fault, the sins that you have in your life. Now listen, this verse is a prime example of how we who have fallen and been restored and now we embrace the opportunity and ministry to be able to tell somebody else that Jesus Christ loved you, even though you may be ashamed, afraid, or, or having difficulties even dealing with that yourself. So what have we seen so far? We've seen what Satan desires. We find out that he is a scheming adversary. But we see also, to counter that, what Jesus, our Savior, desires. And he desires determination and endurance in life. That's what it's going to be. The race is not to the swift, but he who endures until the end. We must understand that. But as we, we, we start to come to a close, let's look at what Peter desired. 
verses 33 and 34 says this. But Peter said to him, Jesus is saying, when you fail, strengthen your brother. And then verse 33, Peter says to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to both the prison and to death. And Jesus responds to him by saying this, Peter, I tell you that the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. See, regardless of his many faults that Peter had, and so uh, 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 we likewise, Peter was devoted to Christ. He was a man of great faith. He actually walked on water to prove that as well. He was a part of the inner circle of Jesus Christ. And look at all the great things that he accomplished after Jesus Christ was ascension into heaven. And I believe that at first, Peter's first sermon, what, 3,000, 5,000 people got saved as well. But Peter's reply was simply this. I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. I'll die for you, Jesus Christ, is what he was saying. Even though we know what was fixing to happen, I believe this without a doubt, that Peter was 100% sincere about the statement that he made. He was 100% for Jesus Christ. But it just tells me the frailness of, of, of who we are as he, humans, how we, we intend to do right. We make up our minds to do right. But then Monday morning when life happens to us as well, we fall back into the same old rut. And we start following the flesh again instead of the spirit. We go back to common sense instead of spiritual sense as well because that's what we know most of all. And, 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 and I think about this in the ministry and the number of times that I've been in prisons and I've seen young men come to the altar to give their life to Christ. I've seen the number of times that I've seen somebody conclude that, listen, I'll give up the habit of smoking, I'll give up the habit of drugs and, and, and all these things. We make these sincere uh, comments and convictions at times. And we are very sincere about it, but life begins to happen to us as well. So all we can do is, and all I can do is encourage you is just to remember what Jesus Christ has said, that he's praying for you as well. He's that one mediator between God and man. And he's ready and willing to restore you from the sins that you have in your life. I don't know about you, but that's motivation to me to just try one more time. Just get up and try one more time to be able to overcome whatever it is that you're dealing with in life. And God will want us to know that because he wrote, it, it's in 1 John 1, 9. For his word tells us this, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And I know you're saying, well, well, I did that yesterday. Well, I say to you today, do it again today. And then tomorrow when you mess up, do it again, even then. What about you? Where do you fit in this story? What's your life all about? Have you failed? If you fail, I just want to let you know that Jesus Christ is there. And Jesus wants you to be restored. He wants you to, re to experience the hope, the joy, the love, and the peace that you can only experience when you walk with a Savior on a daily basis. Do you want to begin the journey back to the top? Are you ready to return to work for Jesus Christ, to the ministry that God has called you in your life? Do you desire to be restored to a right relationship with Jesus Christ? You have that opportunity right now. If you confess your sins, God is faithful and he is just to forgive you, cleanse you of all unrighteousness. That's your opportunity. Perhaps you'll say, well, he's not my savior. Then this becomes an opportunity for you to ask Jesus Christ to come into your life. Give life a try with Christ. I, I, I would stack everything that I possibly could on my side. Because you see, if I'm right about Jesus Christ, you have heaven to gain. But if I'm wrong, you didn't lose anything anyway. Here's the idea. 
when you come into this world, according to the scriptures, your destiny is hell. And you have to figure out some way to be able to change your destination. You have to reprogram the GPS in your life. And you have to start marching toward a different destination, which is a home in heaven. And that's why the Bible teaches us so very much is that you must be born again in life. If you have not been born twice, then you can't live forever. This is the great opportunity that I offer you today. Ask Jesus Christ to come into your life. Be Lord of your life. Be Savior. Give you an opportunity to be restored. Thank you so very much. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you're such a generous God. That you're a God who you're not looking to judge us, not throw us away. Because you created us, you made us, you know our frailty, you know our mindset, you know how we, we, we so very often move to the common sense mind. And you try so very hard to give us an opportunity to be spiritual. But God, I pray that your Holy Spirit is in us, around us, all the time. I pray for the Stevens family. I pray for uh, just, just for our country. I pray for the Pine Grove Church family. The many people that we are able to impact and affect by doing the Facebook and YouTube. God, we thank you. Grow this ministry. In Jesus' name we do pray. The book says, I'm healed until the day of redemption. The book says, I've been sealed, according to that same book, to prosper and be in health is right. Lift up your hand and say what the gill say. Every, every promise, every promise in, the in the book is mine. Think about it. From Genesis all the way down to Revelation. Every chapter, every, every yeah.